Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glustic channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and fantasy world history videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button or backing me on Patreon where you can get access to all the scripts I write for these videos and of course subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week so you have something to listen to while commuting to and from work or at work or after work as you chill in an evening enjoying your hobbies. Time to delve into the history of the Netheril Empire once more. This is the second video in the series and today we will be looking at one of the most interesting periods of the last great empire of magic on the world of Toril. One that played a dominant role over the continent of Faerun as humanity rose to great heights, quite literally, thanks to their mastery of the mystic forces and their willingness to use those powers with very little restraint. In our last video we talked about the beginnings of the Netheril Nation, the alliance with the Elani Elves the Seven Citadels War, the fall of the Emaskari Empire, the Netheril Religion, the Orc Wars, the discovery of the Nether Scrolls, the Demi-Human Subjugation and Liberation, the Age of Artifice, the Alliance with the Dwarves, the First Flying City-States and the Amazing Mithilars, the war that with the dreaded Faerum and the long history of the Ark Wizard Ireland. Today we will talk about the period of magical experimentation, invention, mastery and the culture of the mageocracy that brought us so many of the spells that are so commonly found in the training and use of mages across Faerun and far beyond to this day. So sit back, grab a beverage and <laughs> join me because we're about to get deeply nerdy. I'll be quoting directly from Netheril Empire of Magic written by the legendary Dale Slade Henson along with Jim Butler and published in 1996. Slade is attributed with coming up with the idea for Planescape after the Spelljam alignment of books ended, uh, which is why you see some references to Spelljam in the Netheril books, which uh, David Cook then developed. Slade wrote some excellent material which you are about to witness. Slade's introduction to the book is also great and I'll just quote it directly. Netheril evokes images of a mystical territory of glistening beauty and cultivated extravagance, of days unfettered by care and nights untouched by the hand of darkness. Most think of Netheril as the land of plenty, of the magical dream come true, paradise. Was everything so perfect? Was Netheril the age that should be instead of the age that was? Was Netheril really the climax of humanity? If so, why did the kingdom abruptly collapse with so few survivors? Within the pages of these books, mysteries are revealed. Here, you and your characters will experience firsthand the awesome power and lavishness that was Netheril. Many rules have been altered to fit the particular setting of Netheril, but with little adjustments, play can com commence immediately. DMs and players alike will easily find the rules needed to play in this setting. In particular, arcanists, priests, deities, spells, and magical items are altered to fit in with the primitive magic permeating Netheril. So welcome to paradise and live in cultivated extravagance for as long as the magical dream stays true. See, this box set of books actually allows people to set their game in the land of Netheril during the days of the Great Empire, so the information it contains on the Netherese and their history is quite extensive. Now where were we? Ah yes, the rise of the Age of Magic. As always, it seems to start with a gifted genius who, through sheer talent and drive, breaks the existing state of things and paves the path for a new era. In the case of Netheril, there were two mages who really kicked off the Age of Magic, following the scuttery of the Nether Scrolls. First, Congenio Ion born well over 4,000 years ago, invented Congenio's pebbles, which later became known as the Ion Stones. He created his first at the tender age of 33, which was unheard of at the time, and during his lifetime he created 30 different magical stones that orbit around the owner's head and grant them magical powers. Magic items in those days were very difficult and costly to make, not just in time and materials, but in the amount of study required to learn the permanency spell, plus the process of making an item with permanent effects took its power from the mage's own body, a process not many arcanists were willing to succumb to as it eventually left them appearing much older and bent with the physical price that they paid. Next, of course, one of the greatest human arc wizards to ever grace the lands of Toril and perhaps one of the longest lived creatures currently known, Iolam 
who we talked about at the end of the last History of Netherall video, which I only touched on was how dedicated he was to the protection of the Netherese people from the primary threat they faced, which was periodic massed raids and near constant attacks on caravans and bordering farmlands by the orcs of the frozen north and savage frontier mountains to the west. Ilam was also a primary influence on Netherese spellcraft, and during the era of his life, he trained over 3,000 arcanists and was the archmage who created the first Mithalar and the first flying city. Just as important though was his reason for doing this. His motivation was always his hatred of the invasive orc species and later uh, in, his well, in his early life he was much more dedicated to the complete extermination and just as he was to the mastery of magic. Ilorm led a major battle in minus 3146 DR bringing thousands of Netherese spellcasters and warriors to mount an attack against the largest concentration of orcs in Netheril's land at the time, within the rampant peaks. Fourteen days later, the orcs retreated, but not before over 10,000 of them lay laying rotting on the slopes of and the valleys of the rampart peaks. Ayalum, however, was not finished. He wanted to find out where the orcs were stationed, and he wanted to remove the threat forever. He determined that nothing was going to stop his conflict until every orc was exterminated. After years of scouting, tracking and scrying, Arlom's outriders and seers found the major habitats of the orcs, the hill country surrounding the headwaters of the Canton River. Gathering a massive army of 50,000 troops, Arlom began his greatest campaign, a genocidal war that lasted 16 months called the Excursion into Extinction. It cost the Netheril Empire the lives of 32,000 warriors, but in surrounding the whole area and setting up magical gates to allow the troops to move instantly from one location to another, over 140,000 orcs were slaughtered, their bodies reddening the snows of two mountains that became known as Bone Hill and Thunder Peak. Returning triumphant to his magical research, it was then that he discovered how to create a crystal artifact that could by bypass the weave created and controlled by the goddess Mistral. To tap into the undercurrent of raw magical power directly, he called this device a Mithalar. Now, magical items could be created that could draw their power from the Mithalar rather than from the limiting weave, and as long as they stayed within a mile of the artifact, they would continue to function as if permanently enchanted. Once this magical wonder was created, the floodgates were opened and the nation of Netheril was suddenly faced with a glut of magical items. It was like a magical power source had been discovered. The prices of such quasi-magical items dropped to one-tenth the going rate for real magical items, and the cost of magic items that could operate beyond the range of the Mithalar tripled. The orcs, in the meantime, were drastically reduced in number, struggling to survive the winters and raiding netheral farms and caravans in disproportionate numbers compared to their prior population. Tired of fighting orcs, goblins and others who wanted to feed off the toils of the netheries, Ayalum took one of his mithlars to the southern section of the rampart, rampant peaks and sheared off the mountain summit with an 11th level spell. Using a form of turns, levitation and chronomancer's gravity reversals, he placed the mithlar in the center of the flat side, effectively upside down, and rotated the mountain point down, giving him a large circular flat surface on which to build a city. He called the new structure Ayalum's Enclave, and it soon became a flying city as people from all across Netheril flocked to him, wanting to live in the clouds high above the threat of those who fear and don't understand magic. As the leader and creator of Oelum's Enclave, the Archwizard was in absolute control. He allowed the people to have a say, and he sometimes took their advice and wishes to heart, but when it came down to hard decisions, Oelum made them all. While Netheril was concentrating its efforts to increase the number of floating cities, which by minus 28,012 DR had risen to 13 in number, the Orcs were feeling the pressure of extinction. They felt the only way to continue as a race was to raid the lands of the Netherese. That year, a major offensive was set against the cities of Zenith and Conch. The Orc threat began moving towards the Seventon region. The Seven Cities sent their finest warriors westward to confront the Orcs, only to be turned back when work, word of an Orc sneak attack east of Seventon reached their ears. Seventon had never fought a two-front war before, and with the help of Ayalum's enclave, the Seventon region would have turned into spoils ripe or for Orc plunder. But they were thwarted. It was around minus 2,759 DR that a mega load of iron, gold, mercury, silver and platinum was found that would supply all of Netheril's raw minerals needs for the following 1,100 years. 
This, combined with the continuous rising of flying enclaves, thanks in large part due to arc wizards seeking status in the upper society based on the mastery of magic, and the tradition of the enclave's archmaids being the sole authority there, this prompted an era of expansion into the western frontier in what became known as the Silver Age of Netheril. The constantly available magic from Mithalars allowed relatively low-level arcanists to create quasi-magical items for the common person in mind, with the most popular and useful items becoming indispensable in every home and making the arcanists who invented them extremely wealthy. An age of magical consumerism saw the invention of simple room lights, a globe that continued to continuously shed light on a room. This ended with it being perfected into a globe that would light in a cat on an activating command or sound depending on the desires of the purchaser. Soon every house floating on an enclave had one in every room. Next came running water, contrived by opening a permanent fissure into the elemental plane of water, controlling the flow with a simple spigot. Once this was accomplished and sold to every house, indoor plumbing and water closets were the next logical step. Every facet of Netherese's high society had its share of magical gadgets, from personal grooming and fashion to architecture and exotic pets. Meanwhile, Netheril set its eyes on the rich resources held in foreign lands inhabited by people who they considered little more than barbaric savages and simpletons. Netheril's arc wizards expanded their sphere of divination to the east and the west, but found the land to the west more to their liking. The east was home to nations who were rising in power, although not really following the magical paths set down by Netheril. A few arc wizards, however, debated whether to subjugate the eastern nations under their rule, but all those plans to infiltrate the eastern cultures were laid to rest when the western lands proved to be a vastly easier target. A figure known as the Terra Seer, who went on a 22-month expedition to the west and returned with glowing reports on the rich resources, and in his, his view, it was Netheril's duty to rule the land, as to allow such a place to be squandered on inferior savages would be a crime against progress and enrichment, an argument which swayed the masses. And so many outposts were created. At one point, 3,000 owlbears were destroyed to establish just one important location. From there, the Netherese provided water and provisions to caravan trains and also kept a close watch on the increasingly uneasy Ilifan elves in the region who, well, you can just imagine the concerns of the elven people as they saw enclave after enclave rising into the sky, more and more settlements encroaching rapidly on their homeland, and the military power that damn near wiped the orcs off the face of the planet, now casting a lot of scrutiny their way. Tensions were high. The time of the Chronomancer's birth in minus 2208 DR marks the beginning of Netheril's Golden Age, when the nation was at the very pinnacle of its power. Netheril began lifting one enclave into the sky per year. Soon, dozens of these magnificent monoliths of magic rode the air currents or moved in orbital patterns around the loosely defined borders of the Netheril Empire. Each arc wizard who created his enclave heeded Ilum's example, setting up his or her own laws and guidelines that the enclave's residents had to follow. As time went on, the people had less and less say, and their voice regarding changes in government, tax rates and such were drowned out by the arc wizard's lust for power. The enclave soon became a vehicle to providing funding for the arc wizard's spell research, a staging area for campaigns against other arch wizards and their petty rivalries, and excursions into quasi and para elemental planes. Also bear in mind that this was still 3970 years ago going by our current year on earth, and consider what technological level our planet had at that time. The Chronomancer was concerned about the other human civilizations on Faerun, however. He felt that Netheril's snobbery toward less magically developed nations was a mistake that would come back and haunt the Empire. While the Chronomancer shared many of the Ark Wizards' weaknesses, such as a belief that the gods were just powerful Ark Wizards who could be challenged, he also cared about the well-being of Netheril's neighbors. This included the Elves, Dwarves, and Barbarian peoples. When news of an orc hog ravaging the Ilask nation in minus 2104 DR reached his ears, he entered the fray, helping the human settlements fend off the attack. Unfortunately, even the incredible power of the Chronomancer couldn't save the nation and he fell victim to a degenerative wound that killed him eight years later. He very well could have taken healing and curative spells to fix his ailment, but like all of Netheril Ark's wizard, Ark Wizards, he believed the gods were merely Ark Wizards like himself, who found ultimate magic. Their pride wouldn't allow them to put their faith in the deities for fear that if they put their trust in these advanced Ark Wizards, they would never achieve ultimate magic themselves. 
so they never accepted divine healing magic. That in itself tells you so much about the extreme arrogance and attitude of the people of Netheril, doesn't it? Netheril was never without some rising menace, however. Orcs and ogres and the Ark Wizards had to spend a lot of time dealing with enemies from both the surface world and from within their own ranks. This included destructive acts by Netheril citizens as well as the non-humans that swarmed around and within the Netheril borders. In the year minus 1897 DR, Netheril bore witness to an internal menace. Citizens who had little aptitude or respect for magic. Nine of them broke into the most holy and magical chamber of Iolum the Demi Divine, killing nine guards in the process and losing uh, seven of their numbers they, to steal 24 parts of the Nether Scrolls. When the thieves escaped to the surface world, a manhunt began. The thieves, fearful of the Ark Wizard's retribution, pounded the priceless golden scrolls into indiscernible baubles. They then sold these gold nuggets, receiving about 260 gold pieces as a reward. Another significant event which was uh, when the first enclave fell in minus 1658 DR, when the floating city of Sunrest yielded to the effects of ill-planned spell research. The city hailed the impending creation of a spell called Sunrest Sunshock, which was an early attempt at an ultra-powerful meteor swarm spell. But an accident occurred. The spell probably worked correctly, especially when eyewitness accounts from the City of Remembrance reported a blinding flash of light from the west with a deafening roar that followed a few moments later. Those who watched were horrified to see the whole enclave fall to the ground into a heap of rubble and stone. No one survived the accident. After that incident, the exhausted mines of Decanter were reopened three years after they were finally shut down and the magical research facility was built within for public safety. I will be blowing your mind with details on that magical research very soon, don't you worry. Next we get to the Age of Discovery, which was also an era filled with some very nasty activities on the part of the Empire which have left a long lasting legacy. In minus 1260 uh, miners delving elsewhere brought up some new gemstones which they thought might be useless, but when examined by the arcanist known as Elorian, she found that these were loaded with magical potential for some reason. She named them uh, Chardolins, and her further research revealed that the gems could hold a single spell that was cast into them, later releasing the magic when the fragile gem was simply crushed. This discovery launched the Empire into an expedition frenzy that lasted more than 500 years. The discovery of the Shardolin gems caused many of the Netherese enclaves to intensify their efforts in mining the surrounding hills and region, uh, mountains. Many of the Ark Wizards believed even greater riches awaited discovery, and they invested huge sums of money in an effort to be the first to find them. Next in line of importance behind Shardolins was spell jamming, or flying ships into realm space, the Skyward Realms, as the Space Mariners, mariners of Yeoman's Loft called realm space, was believed to be the first great uh, next frontier for raw materials such as mind ores, spellcraft and discovered magical items. The Omens Loft explorers, however, were also responsible for racial experiments, basically vivisecting anything they came across. This gave the Netherese, the only humans to have ventured into realm space up until uh, minus 10,065 DR, a very bad name and a horrid reputation akin to the fear generated when an illithid spelljamming ship was seen. This dread did nothing but separate the Netherese from the spelljamming community already in space and made trade nearly impossible. In fact, Netherese ships were attacked on sight. Oberon, an arcanist born during the time in Netheril's history, tried his best to mend his nation's reputation in space, but it was to no avail. 100 years after the first ship ventured above Toril's surface, Netheril recalled the last one. The tremendous expense of armoring and defending their ships for exceeding far exceeding any profits that they'd made in realm space. Since the Netheries were unsuccessful in creating other helms and other spelljamming items being forced to rely on the arcane for such materials, they decided to drop out of realm space and aside from the efforts of a dedicated few, that was the last period in Toril's history where realm space travel off-world was common. The birth of the infamous Archmage Carsis in minus 679 DR marks the beginning of the Shadowed Age, referring to the shadows of Netheril's doom beginning uh, arriving in the background, leading up to the casting of Cassus's avatar and the cataclysmic end of the Netherese Empire. But I think it's time to talk about the amazing advancements and the frenzy of invention that occurred over these many centuries that formed so much of the fundamental spellcraft we all know and use all the time with our spellcasting characters. 
So let's talk about what the Arcanists were as you can no doubt heard me say this quite a few times in the video and we're thinking I was just using another word for wizard, but no, the spellcasters of Netheril were quite different. First of all, as mentioned, they all believed that the gods were nothing but supremely powerful archmages at a level that they would eventually attain through magical mastery. Therefore, they never willingly received a divine healing as they saw that as surrendering to their chance of becoming gods themselves. Instead, they relied heavily on healing potions, which were the result of alchemy and magic, the products of their own hands, and thus fine. They also only had three schools of magic, which were inventives, mentalisms, and variations. The inventor cast spells that created or destroyed something, the mentalist cast spells that affected the mind, and the variator cast spells that altered things, even magic itself. There were no generalist mages in Netheril. Each arcanist chose a major field of study and a minor field, and the third field contained spells the arcanist could never learn. For example, an arcanist could choose variations as a major and inventors of a minor, giving them no access to mentalisms at all. The arcanist was able to research and create spells up to a maximum allowed by level and intelligence in their major field, but they were only able to cast spells out of their major field and minor fields. The third skill, which the arcanist chose not to select, was inaccessible. Some spells existed in all three schools though, such as read magic. One of the largest differences between Netherese spellcasters and their brethren from more modern times concerned the aspect of spell memorization. Arcanists didn't memorize spells, they simply reached into the weave, the source of all magic, and plucked out the mystical energies they sought. They still recorded the spells that they knew upon spell books for review from time to time, but they didn't need to spend hours studying for spells. They could still cast only the spells they knew, however, and their magical storehouse of knowledge still required a good night's sleep to replenish itself. Learning a new spell was far trickier for an arcanist as well. Sometimes the botched attempt would see them never able to cast that spell at all, forever. So in some ways, they were more like sorcerers. An arcanist advanced in level, they gained access to a greater number of arcs. These arcs equated to the number of spell levels that the caster could cast in a single day. In addition, an arcanist's level dictated how deep into the weave they could go for their spells. So the level of spell, as we think of it these days, actually refers to how deep into the weave the spellcaster must be able to reach in order to summon enough power to achieve the desired effects. It was not until an arcanist reached at least level 20 that they could attempt to become an arc wizard though, as the arc wizards were the rulers of the float floating enclave cities and garrisons of the empire. While some arcanists became arc wizards by taking over a city established by another arc wizard who had met an untimely demise, most followed the prescribed course of action that their peers required, the creation of a floating city. Creating an enclave was a tremendous task, however. It required the creation of a mythalar, shaving off the top of a mountain with very powerful magic, hiring builders and architects to create a unique environment that allowed the arch wizards to stand out amongst his rivals with their impressive architecture and wonders, and finally luring citizens to the enclave with such wonders and, of course, the standard of living. Of course, once all of this was accomplished, the daily demands of running an enclave were very time-consuming, and quite often interrupted with their magical research. I think the best way to cover the spell knowledge developed during this era, stretching from minus uh, 2580 DR to uh, minus 341 DR, is to go over what spells were created in what year and what their original names were where I can. Typically, the arcanists and archwizards who invented the new spells concentrated on certain uh, special types of magic, as you'll see, and because of their restrictions due to being arcanists and the uh, only three spell schools. Zwei was the first Netherese arcanist to be credited with the creation of new spells. The Variator introduced the three successfully more powerful extension spells that extended the duration of other spells. In the 20 years between minus 2580 DR and minus 2560 DR, so 85 years later, the arcanist Saidbreath created the spell Reinc uh, Reincarnation in the city of Imbru, basically the Las Vegas of Netheril, thanks to the huge casino temple to Taiki, the uh, goddess of luck, and 11 years later created Saidbreath's Undead Control spell, now known commonly as Control Undead. Saidbreath was a cross-class 
a priest of the goddess Mistral, and an arcanist who was never happy that the godly winds, as the Netherese referred to clerical magic, were not all duplicated by in the fields of magic available to arcanists. So he spent much of his life trying to duplicate the priest spells into usable arcanist forms. So he wanted mages essentially to be able to heal just like wizard uh, priests could. Despite little to show for his efforts, he remained true to his faith in Mistral, and unlike other arc wizards of Netheril, he felt there was truly something divine about the gods. 78 years later, the inventive arcanist and formerly student of Sabreth named Toledine produced the Gust of Wind spell, followed eight years later by his Wind Wall spell, and only four years later, the Cloud Kill spell. And then after another 11 years, he created two new spells named Death Fog and Stinking Cloud. But his crowning achievement came only four years later when in minus 20... Uh, 2359 DR, only a year before his own death from old age, he created he, well, he created Netheril's first epic spell, named Toledine's Killing Wind. He concentrated more literally on the area of winds and also lived in the city of Imbu. Twenty years later, Noana wandered up f- to Netheril from the south. He settled in Can- uh, Candlespire, which during the Silver Age of Netheril was a town taken from 3,000 strong population of ogres in a fearsome battle that lasted for eight years and cost thousands of Netherese lives. But when Noana arrived and lived there, the town was in a heavy reconstruction phase to the Netherese standards and the rich lands were being heavily developed for farming. Still, the threat of ogre reprisals was extremely high. Noana quickly developed an outstanding, um, into an outstanding arcanist who was consumed with the discovery of fire-related magic, and he was given the title of the Fire Warden by Ayalum in minus 2,325 DR. In minus 2,320 DR, he invented Noana's Trap, now known as Fire Trap, and eight years later, he invented Wall of Fire. Four years later, Fire Shield, Two years later, Delayed Blast Fireball, and two years after that, the Fireball spell. Understandably, his spells became staples in the retinue of powerful arcanists, much as they are today. Noana's testing of spells was primarily conducted on the battlefield surrounding Candlespire. Ogres were easily found if one knew where to look, and the Fire Warden was quite proficient at getting their attention. He was killed in a skirmish with the ogres of the area, somewhat inevitably, and they dragged his body off with him in minus 2301 DR. Now we come to the amazing Treb. Born in minus 2293 DR, an extremely powerful mentalist arc wizard, probably one of the most prolific spell creators of Netheril, a specialist in magic that protected the arcanist as he was the master of spell duels and quite involved with research on volatile magic, including a later discovery called heavy magic, which I'll probably talk about in a later video. I'll skip the year by year account and just list the spells Treb invented over 43 years between minus 2,281 dr and minus 22238 dr they were treb's eye now known as wizard eye detect undead identify treb scorai magic which is now lost unfortunately spell turning anti-magic shell minor globe of invulnerability globe of invulnerability detect invisibility weird detect scrying detect evil and no alignment In minus 2268 DR, around the time he was about to invent his anti-magic and invulnerability spells, Treb established the enclaves of Shadowtop Burrow. It was a center for magical research and trade with neighboring humanoids, but it was also the site uh, for the creation of an evil and twisted artifact called the Crown of Horns. A spellcasting incident in minus 2238 DR killed Treb while he was completing his work on the Crown of Horns. Little is known of the arcanist named Velate, other than that they invented the spells Velate's Whispering in minus 2119 DR, later known as Whispering Wind, and three years later Velate invented the spell Velate's Restriction, now known as Bind. This takes us from the end of the age of the Silver Age of Netheril and into the Golden Age, where the invention of spells exploded somewhat, as it became a matter of gaining name recognition and putting them steps closer to the power required to create a floating city of their own, which they could rule over. So it was a combination of creating magical items that the common people would buy, gaining you wealth, 
uh, name recognition from creating new spells and then of course using that wealth and name recognition to create your own floating enclave attracting a population of people to there and of course ruling it and becoming super powerful axa chronomancer lefebvre proctive were all major figures of the golden age and we'll talk about them right now axa the destroyer born in minus 2190 dr was a scraggly haired arcanist variator who sought control over magic that destroyed or altered objects he was a fierce man with a uh, and he was prone to sudden actions many of which were poorly planned he lived in a large home in the island city of harborage a structure that was always in need of emergency repair he created a variety of useful spells in his 170 years of life the first was his uh, when he was only 21 years of age he created axar's repair now known as the spell called mending it was 27 years later that he created his next spell in minus 2142 dr called axar's object which became the spell called item 22 years later he invented the spell enlarge then in order of invention by year he created fabricate shatter disintegrate glassy not to be confused with glass steel which he and proctive were in something of a competition over this kind of magic axe's version made metal stone or wood transparent while the magic was active then he invented the spell passwall and finally polymorph any object when experimenting with his disintegrate spell axe disintegrated one inch holes through the north wall of his house he had expected an entire section of the wall to disintegrate instead and was rather surprised that the spell was behaving in the pinpoint fashion he was so enamored with the effect however that he cast the spell two more times causing the entire north wall of his house to collapse he shrugged his shoulders and began experimenting with altered version of this uh, of the spell on the south wall while the spell uh, the builders scurried to repair the damage axa was gruff and hard to get close to but his rough demeanor was just an act he was especially fond of children frequently taking time out of his research to disguise himself as a street vendor and perform for the children his disguise fooled no one in harborage but the shows were quite entertaining and frequently contained a message for the adults in his audience lefebvre was an arcanist inventive he created the minor and major creation spells the mark spell now lost but thought to be the basis for the modern wizard's mark spell Lefebvre who also created the spell contingency and the epic spell he created in minus 2118 dr called Lefebvre's weave mythal when cast this spell allowed the magic of the caster or targeted creature to be immune to the influence of a mythal it also prevented power fluctuations augmentations and influence from wild magic the older version of the spell used by arcanists and netheril created a 300 foot barrier sphere which prevented uh, any living creatures construct or undead from crossing it without an activation key and the sphere usually had some other spell attached to it that activated if anything tried to breach it without the key chronomancer was born jiraiya chronos in minus 2208 dr he became a powerful arcanist variator who changed his name to chronomancer after he created his first time oriented spell he was a haughty and determined young man who was constantly concerned about appearances a running joke around the arcanist was that if he ever made a mistake in public he simply go back in time and correct it since time travel didn't work like this a fact known by the other arcanists such jest merely served to make the spellcaster even more self-conscious he didn't like the mockery his concern about appearance spurred his obsession to, he had with finding potions of longevity and other aging remedies like many of the arc wizards he considered age to be a curse placed on the netheries by the gods that served to prevent arcanists from discovering the source of the gold's ultimate god's ultimate power and usurping them his spell invention legacy is impressive though but partly because it was instructional in the work of proctive and the creating of floating encoves at the age of about 49 in minus 2159 dr he invented the re reverse gravity spell followed over many years by the spells time stop and temporal stasis despite his haughty attitude toward the gods he did care enough for the nation of Alusk to give his life to the cause as i mentioned earlier standing nearly alone before a massive orc assault chronomancer was grievously injured and died eight years later from a poisoned um, or infective wound that slowly killed him he had accepted um, had he accepted healing from the gods he probably would have lived proctive has scant record of their life which is a crime considering what they invented a highly gifted arcanist variator they invented the following spells by order of year most seem oriented around the element of earth and construction so the spells 
uh, the lost epic spell called Proctiv's Move Mountain. Yes, he started with the invention of an, uh, an epic spell, talk about a prodigy, followed by Stone Shape, Move Earth, Glass Steel, Transmute Rock to Mud, Transmute Water to Dust, Dig, and finally, in minus 2051 DR, the lost epic spell called Proctiv's Seal Crystal Sphere and Proctiv's Breach Crystal Sphere, which were just the same spell that could be reversed. The material component of the spell was a major spell jamming helm and a spell jamming vessel massing no less than 100 tons. It was capable of permanently shutting off a whole crystal sphere against access by spell jamming ships and the reverse spell uh, could open the seals once more. Toward the end of Proctiv's life, the arcanist Nel Vac, a specialist in all the aspects of light, created the spell Color Spray in minus 2058 DR, followed by the spells Infravision and Rainbow Pattern, which had long been used particularly by illusionists, but also formed the early basis for the work of Smolin and Anglin about a century later. Uh, Quantal was a popular arcanist variator who created the floating city of Jokteleg in minus 2020 DR, it was an entire city devoted to the study of the variator arts, and arcanists from across Nether flocked to its streets. His legacy of spell invention includes the following, in order of year invented. Alter Self, Spider Climb, Slow, Duo Dimension, Strength, Mass Morph, Haste, Polymorph Self, Statue, Wraith Form, Change Self, and Polymorph Other. This last one, well, unfortunately, Quantal's interest in altering things led him to experiment with Enclave's Methylar in minus 1933 DR, and the resulting magical wave permanently transformed all of the Enclave's residents into Vodkin giants. He managed to preserve his own mentality, but he was never able to transform himself or the residents of Jokteleg back into their natural forms. Quantal searched for centuries looking for a counterspell to offset the magical transformations, but he never succeeded. Fourfinger, born in minus 2056 DR, was an arcanist variator who considered himself an expert on weather-related matters. Fourfinger is an unusual person. He lived along the banks of the narrow sea in the city of the Scourge. He um, ardently avoided all contact with other spellcasters of Netheril, preferring to remain in Scourge and continue his weather experiments. The residents of Scourge considered him to be the source of the rust that seemed to permeate the very air, while the rusting winds of Scourge were around long before and long after Fourfinger's death. He was just a mysterious figure, so they attributed it to him out of superstition. It's not quite clear whether Fourfinger was aware of the source of the rusting winds. He seemed to take great joy when storms rolled in off the sea. Many believed he summoned them to the city himself, which is quite likely. Throughout most of his life, seldom a week went by without a terrible storm rolling in off the sea. His contribution to the spellcraft began with the Enchant Weapon spell, but his obsession with atmospheric effects, air and water, led him to the invention of the spells uh, Lower Water, Part Water, and finally, Work Control Weather, one year before his death in minus 1997 DR. Born in 2000, uh, minus 2101 DR, credited with only one spell invention, Deafness, Crag, Dwarf Friend, was the premier arc wizards for the city of Northreach throughout his 106 years of life. Born deaf, the young man applied himself vigorously to the mystic arts and became widely respected among the Netherese arc wizards. He was also highly respected among the dwarves of Askor, and he was visited, uh, well, he visited their stronghold frequently as the Netherese were on fairly good terms with the dwarves, who earned great wealth selling fine metal goods to the Empire. Craig spoke only in sign language, although a rare syllable or two escaped his lips during spellcasting. Surprisingly, he could cast most of his spells without verbal components, but 8th uh, and high, higher level spells still required him to speak to draw upon their power. Born in minus 2032 DR, Luki was an animal-loving an uh, arcanist inventor uh, from Coneferia, who was never found far from an entire horde of conjured and summoned creatures. He possessed a scraggly grey cat that posed as his familiar and confidant, though there were many rumours as to who was really possessing who, as whispers spoke of the cat actually being a dragon in disguise. Luki was quick to share his first three monster summoning spells invented between minus 1995 DR and minus 1974 DR, but became more and more disillusioned with his fellow spellcasters when he discovered that some of the arcanists were using his summoned creatures as entertainment in the gladiatorial arenas. 
He continued with his research, inventing monster summoning 4 in minus 1862 DR, 5 in minus 1835 DR, 6 in minus 1813 DR, and 7, his final monster summoning spell in minus 1780 DR. His final two spells were Conjure Animal invented in minus 1765 DR and Contagion, which I imagine was Luki learning how to summon a virus in minus 1746 DR. He eventually left Coniferia uh, in minus 1742 DR at the age of 290 and was never seen again. If any of you who are frustrated why I didn't include any famous wizards from Faerun in my famous wizards video, this is why. <laughs> Moving on. Some of the wizards mentioned, we don't know what their gender was, but Volm, born in minus 2012 DR, was a female arcanist inventor known as the Gentle Lady. She was the most renowned arcanist of her time because, well, she invented the Lightning Bolt spell. She received scores of arc wizards and their apprentices at her home who sought the spell, and she was normally willing to trade in exchange for some new spell of the visitor, some exchange of information, or elven antiquities, which was, she was completely uh, fond of. In minus 9, 1962 DR, the gentle lady of Palta was killed in a spell duel with the arcanist Jarm, who was seeking her lightning bolt spell. Her students tried to avenge her death, but they were killed off one by one as they made their attempts on Jarm. During her lifetime, Volum also invented, in order by year, Shocking Grasp, then her Lightning Bolt spell, then Energy Drain, and finally, her last spell in minus 1965 DR was Chain Lightning. So the Energy Drain spell is obviously related to the electricity of the body. Jan is not a wizard I would have liked to run into. Born in minus 2019 DR, the lawful evil arcanist inventor became the resident arcanist of Earsome from minus 1965 DR. He was 54 years old um, when he became the resident wizard there. Up until his death at the hands of assassins at the age of 133 in minus 1886 DR. He was a ruthless man who used poison or other quick and efficient means to rid himself of any unwanted competition. This included visiting arcanists who just happened to be passing through the town. Despite his ruthless nature, Jan fought alongside many of the town's defenders through the countless battles against the orcs of the Hidden Forest. The only nemesis he didn't have the courage to assassinate was the powerful priest of Mistral called Shastin. During his life, Jan was credited with inventing many spells, though I wonder, given their diverse nature, if he might have stolen a lot of them and claimed them as his own work. His spells in order of year are Mount, Magic Jar, Summon Swarm, Spectral Hand, Irritation and Legend Lore. Now we get to Anglin and Smolin. Little is known of the biography of Smolin. I know they were born before Anglin and actively inventing a lot of fundamental illusionary spells around the same time Anglin was working on his prismatic spells, so they probably either shared a lot of notes or hated each other. Who knows? Smolin's spells in order of invention are Blindness, Foresight, True Seeing, Blur, Veil, Eye Bite, false vision and their final invention in minus 1917 DR called Smolin's Replica, which we now all know by the name Mirror Image. Somehow, given the nature of those spells, it's little wonder little is known about who Smolin really was. <laughs> Anglin of Seventon was born in uh, minus 2030 DR. He was responsible for many of the prismatic based spells. Living in Seventon, Anglin was constantly worried about shielding himself and the town from attack. Thus, many of his spells dealt with watching for danger, shielding himself from attack, and dispersing attacking creatures. He was a very well-respected general in the Seventon Militia. The Arcanist also ran a small school in Seventon called the Summoned Sorcerer. From here, he taught those that desired to learn spellcraft the nuances of magic, asking only in return that they serve in Seventon Militia for at least five years after he finished training them was quite reasonable. Anglin was killed when a spell he was researching tentatively called Anglin's Gateway backfired, sucking him through a mystic portal to who knows where or when. His spells in order of invention are Magic Mirror, Prismatic Spray, Prismatic Wall, and Prismatic Sphere. During the same era, the little known arcanist Primadon was creating some of the most iconic flame spells. In minus 1968 DR they invented Flaming Sphere, then eight years later came Flame Arrow, 12 years later came Incendiary Cloud, six years later the spell Pyrotechnics, 
and some 32 years later in minus 1910 DR, Primadon invented the spell Burning Hands. Born in 1000, uh, minus 1960 DR, the arc wizard mentalist named Cheva was a driven discoverer, even more so by the, uh, driven for the preservation of knowledge. In minus 1927 DR, he established the floating city of Opus and set about creating a network of colleges, universities and theatres to both preserve the knowledge that he had acquired and to demonstrate to Opus's citizens the usefulness of such social structures. Unfortunately, he was also driven to create new spells. <laughs> his simulacrum spell proved quite useful and the arc wizards across Neville saw the usefulness of the simulacrums immediately. But his thirst for knowledge led him to the planes, and his contact with other plane spell, which he invented, eventually cost him his life when he leapt through into a sphere of annihilation in minus 1900 DR. The apprentices claimed his final days were ones of desperation. He spent ever increasing amounts of time in study, discussing matters of importance with whatever extraplanar creature he was in contact with. His notes, which were usually well organized and complete, were nothing but gibberish when they were finally collected. Such are the hazards of a transdimensional lifestyle. Again. Not a shock that not much is remembered of Keonid, other than the many spells they created. Certainly a mentalist, their spells in order of appearance beginning in minus 1902 DR were Gesh, Confusion, Friends, Emotion, Fear, Forget, Charm Person, Mass Charm, and finally in minus 1850 DR, they invented the spell Suggestion. Death Ed. Born in minus 1991 DR and died at the ripe old age of 25, well, sort of, he holds the dubious record of transforming himself into a lich at the age of 25, which it must be said greatly enhanced his research into the variety of spells he created that are extremely harmful to living creatures, and he greatly enjoyed creating magical traps that killed the living. The arcanist inventor became known as the Death Lich, for good reason, and spent most of his days holed up in his laboratory within the enclave of the Great Iolum. He created the spell Clone in minus 1898 DR, which is an interesting area of study for a lich. 14 years later, he invented Trap the Soul. Then his signature spell, he simply called Death Ed Spell in minus 1882 DR, which we now know as the Death Spell. And 17 years later, he invented Finger of Death. He proved less than productive after that. He took no students, preferred instead to remain in isolation, and his research proved to be his undoing. As Iolum destroyed him for using his Trap the Soul spell to take over the body of another Arcanist's apprentice. Nobody likes a chaotic neutral lich living in their basement. We don't know much about the mentalist Prug except for the collection of six spell inventions that have proven very popular over the centuries, beginning with Prug's Dominate in minus 1875 DR, now known simply as Domination. Prug also invented Hold Monster, Hold Person, which was originally called uh, Hold Human and Hold Monster was called Hold Being, Hold the Undead, and Charm Plant which is plant control, and also the spell Repulsion. Wait, I've skipped someone. Oh, of course, Keonid. No, wait, damn it, I already covered Keonid. Ah, amazing. Dace, born in minus 1898 DR, a lifelong devout follower of the goddess Mistral. He spent almost his entire career at the dedicated mosque in the prestigious Iolum enclave. While in service to the lady, he created a variety of language-based spells, beginning with Dace's Comprehension in minus 1865 DR, better known as the Comprehend Languages spell. Followed five years later by Ventriloquism, then the following year he invented the spell Tongues, and 19 years later the spell Taunt. Dace's actions won him few friends in the Arc Wizard community, since they believed the gods to be just one step above themselves in power. Many criticized Dace about his career choice, telling him he should have chased the winds, meaning the divine paths of magic, and become a priest. His death was the fault of the other Arc Wizards, who actively worked against him in his attempt to discover potions of longevity and other life-extending magic. His tormentors felt it best for him to reach Mistral's embrace as quickly as possible, and they made sure that when he finally discovered a potion of longevity, that it was cursed, aging him instead of erasing the lines of age, leading to his very fast death. The bastards. In the second half of this video, I will be covering the rest of the Netherese Arcanists and Arc Wizards, beginning with Valdic, the master of force magic, all the way to Cassus as an attempt and his attempt to steal the power of a god. So many wizards of Netheril have contributed spells still in use by modern spellcasters. I'm sure there was quite a few shocks in this video for some of you, so stay tuned, there's still so much more to cover. 
please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.